Welcome to another edition of Vermont Community Commons. Today we have a special guest, Norman James, who from 1959 to 1972 was a veteran news reporter here in Vermont for WDEV, WCAX, and then back with WDEV before his time as press secretary and communications director for then Governor-elect Thomas Salmon. Norman, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you very much, Ken. Pleasure you know, to be here. <laughs> You have covered... <laughs> I hope to entertain you so you can you continue will. that no, jocularity. No, I love... <laughs> I've known this fellow for a very long time. <laughs> and um, we're glad to have you here to tell us some great memories, stories, reflections well, on Vermont history. And you, you started as a young fellow in your 20s at WDEV. Right. It was 1959. Eisenhower is president. It's before right. John Kennedy. Yeah. The interstate highway is being built in Vermont and in Waterbury. Correct. And so tell us about... The beginning. Well, let me lead up to that. Okay. All right. To to my sojourn sure. in here in Vermont. Um, in 1953, I graduated. 1950 from Spalding High from School. From Spalding High School, but 1950, and I went to work down in Springfield, Massachusetts. 1955, I joined the Air Force. I was going to join the Navy, and I walked up the stairs where the recruiting offices were, and I went to the left to go in the Navy, and the guy was set out to lunch. So I walked in to the Air Force, and on the thing it said, Sergeant Wing. I said, there I am. <laughs> so I joined the Air Force, four years. Um, the last uh, two and a half years I was in the Air Force, I was stationed in the Philippines at Clark Air Base. And I was at Headquarters 13th Air Force um, as a radio and television news announcer for Armed Forces Radio and Television. How I got there is another story. We'll get to that one later, maybe. But so I gained whatever experience I had for broadcasting on the air in the Air Force. I want to give them credit for that. So I did come back to DEV. I came back home, um, called up Rusty, Rusty Parker, that is, uh, asked me to come in for an audition. It was a CBS audition. And I got everything right until I got to the pronunciation of Haverhill. And I am reading the news. As in New Hampshire? Or As in New Hampshire. Or Harriman? Right. And no, and no here New Hampshire. <laughs> And I kept saying, Haverhill. <laughs> and after it was all over, Rusty, You're hired. Said, Rusty said, it's Haverhill. <laughs> but this is interesting because uh, it was the old Ken, Ken Squire's father, Lloyd Squire, right. who listened to the tape and I think had, uh, had something to say about that. Because right about that time, Ken was uh, ending his college career Correct. down in Boston and coming back. And, and at that time, DEV was changing its format in the morning from mm -hmm. 6 to noon. Mm -hmm. I was on the air from 2, um, actually I was not on the air, I was there at the station from 2 until 11 at night. Mm -hmm. and I was on the air at 4 o'clock with a show called Spins and Needles. Hi there guys and gals, teens and queens. This is the guy with the two front names, Norm James, sitting twixt the twin turntables, dusting off the stacks of wax for your listening pleasure on the Spins and Needles show. <laughs> this is great. This is great. <laughs> that kind of knocks your what, socks off, there right? also the Harold Grout pasture about the Oh, that president. one. Well, that's, you, you asked me before we went on the air, you asked me uh, about Harold the trading Grout post. did the trading post in the morning. Harold Grout, longtime employee at WDEV. A wonderful human being. Cousin Harold, as he was known, that was his air right. uh, uh, handle. Cousin Harold. And he did the trading post every morning from 6.30 to 7 o'clock, right, on, on, uh, on there. And so it, because of Cousin Harold, Ken came up with the following station break. Uh -huh. um, WDEV, the station of stature in Harold Grout's pasture, on the hill in Colbyville, triple tower power. <laughs> Wonderful and stuff. And those were the days, my friend. Those were the days. Uh, radio. Those were the days. Radio was, is today, although it's changed, obviously. It's very ch much changed. But, God, it was incredible that day. Uh, and I enjoyed it so much because... Uh, it was even before cell phones, obviously, but I always said that give me a telephone, put me in a telephone booth, and I can tell you what's happening. And that's what I, that's, that's where my introduction into real news. What is happening? Mm -hmm. And if you're telling the story about what is happening, you're reporting it. Yes. You're not journalizing it. Now, journalists can write till the cows come home, but all of a sudden, until they, they get to describe what the reporter sees on the scene in radio, because they can already see it on television. Uh, they the television was new. It started in 54. It was brand new. So it was, it five was brand years, new. 59. Is it was, it was, it radio was still dominated. Oh, yes, absolutely. No question. Yeah. 
And DEV at that time, um, we had two patterns. One was the nighttime pattern, that when the sun went down, we had to go from 5,000 watts to 1,000 watts. And the circle was actually was like an egg, right. with a small part of the egg around Burlington, and a big part of the egg down around White River. That's how big our pattern was. Wow. And so when the sun came up, we shipped to 5,000 watts, which was relatively new for DEV at that time in 1959. Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, well, the EV had been on the air since 1938, I believe. Right. 37, 38, something like that. So the thing that. goes from Burlington to White River. Up to White River. That's the basic That's the basic pattern. Right now, you can pick us up in Plattsburgh, you can pick us up in Claremont. Right. And almost into Concord, New Hampshire. Right. So. In uh, Canada. Uh, you, can the pick, you can pick them up in Canada. As a matter of fact, we used to have a conflict uh, with a station around Halifax, Nova Scotia, because they were at 550 on the dial. Oh, wow. And being a Canadian station, they sure. were governed by different rules. Right. And at nighttime, if we went 5,000 watts, right. we interfered with their signal. Sure. And they complained. I understand. WDV goes to Halifax, Nova Scotia now. Well, it was one New Year's Eve when I was working. <laughs> <laughs> it was one New Year's Eve, right? Uh, and New Year, what do you do on New Year's Eve? You don't talk. You play music, Sure. Right? Everybody Guy Lombardo. At, at, well, no. No, this not, Guy, him? not Guy Lombardo, no. Okay. Now you play the good stuff like Count Basie and Duke Ellington. Okay. Right, maybe a, some little George Shearing is in was there, he? Benny Goodman. Uh -huh. You know, uh, yeah, Guy Lombardo, that's for New York City. I see. You know, the top of whatever, the Ambassador Hotel. Sure. That's, that's something for different. the TV people. Well, we were at 1,000 watts, and I'm talking to my engineer who's up on the hill, and, it's, you know, and we have a communication device. I'm saying, you know, I really am in a mood to crank this thing up to 5,000 watts at midnight. What do you think? And the voice comes back and says, I'm with you. And so at, at, at uh, 11.59.30, uh, we paused just for a minute so he could do whatever adjustments he hit. And he said, bang, he came back and he said, you're on. So 5,000 watts, I gave a big station break and I nailed that thing with a big Duke, uh, with, with a Glenn Miller. Thing, right. Like in the mood. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> right. We went to 2 o'clock in the morning. That's wonderful. We got postcards from Pennsylvania. <laughs> That's great. It was fun. Yes. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. And then the, the Kennedy-Nixon race in 1960, very close. I was on the board. And the teletype's going all crazy all the time. Yeah. I was on the board at 5 o'clock in the morning and went to the newsroom. Uh, this is how close the race. We went to the newsroom, pulled out the UPI, I think went back, control room, and I was taking a look at the vote quick totals like that, mm -hmm. there was less than 10,000 votes That's at right. that time. That's right. 10,000 nationally. Who would have ever thought about that? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't remember it being as divisive as we see politics today. Maybe it was in the back room. But I could never, ever imagine that. There were people who were very opinionated. There was no question about that. And it showed. Right? It showed. And that back in 1959, uh, uh, it just absolutely showed that the population in the United States, and it's held fast, have differing opinions, mm -hmm. two major differing opinions, mm -hmm. and now a third is creeping in. Mm -hmm. uh, on some guys, it's called independent, some it's called progressive, some whatever it is, it's just a little bit different. But the traditional parties were very strong back then. Yeah. And the Eisenhower period was coming to a close. Correct. And then John Kennedy was this new senator from Massachusetts. Right. And then right. Adlai Stevenson, for Kennedy to become the nominee was, he won by 14 votes, by the way. Yep. Barely got yes. the nomination with the skin of his teeth. Right. Byron White was the reason why he delivered the Colorado delegation and Wyoming. That's why he became On the, the floor. That's why he became the Supreme Court person. Of course, I'm sure. Yes. Later. Sure, so thank you. Right. It's not a payback, it's a thank you. So then Phil Hoff becomes governor in 62, two years later. Boy, uh, well, and this is let me event. back up a little bit. It's sure. 1960. Uh -huh. Another little vignette of, of uh, relationship with the governor. Um, uh, this was 58, 59. I joined DEV in the latter part of 1959. Bob Stafford is still governor. Right. And there is a soapbox derby, a derby being held in Barry on Park Street, and it goes like this, right? Uh -huh. So they closed off traffic. <laughs> yeah. So I, there, and I'm doing something live, right? You, you, you know, there he goes. So the governor says, oh, Governor Stafford, how are you doing? He says, I'm doing fine. Huh? Here's the governor. Right. right, Bob Stafford. Bob Stafford. Of and he's, got, he's got a live mic on the state's largest radio station. 
And I'm asking, giving him the opportunity to say something, right? right. Gee, they go fast, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like Bob Saver. Yes, yeah, fine. And then that, that went on, right? Um, the campaign uh, 1960, the Republican campaign 1960 between Ray Keyser, the incumbent, and uh, Bob Stafford. Bob Babcock. I mean, Bob Babcock. In the you. primary. It's in the primary. Because Stafford went to Congress. He beat William Meyer. Right. So we're talking <clears throat> about we're talking about the incumbent, right? Ray Keyser against Bob Babcock. Bob Babcock is living in South Burlington. Right. Brian Harwood was given the assignment to go cover Ray Keyser. I was given the assignment to go cover Bob Babcock. And um, you're what, both in your twenties. What, what that what that meant was that we go there and we keep track and we say, "What do you think? <laughs> what do you think? How do you feel? What's in your head?" Oh, that kind of stuff, right? Babcock and I get along very well, and I know that Brian and, and Ray Keyser get along very well. And at one point, Brian said on the air, <laughs> "Maybe we could get your guy and my guy to talk to each other." <laughs> and I said, oh, "Brian, my guy is tied up probably for the next three hours." <laughs> So anyway, that went on, and and the and the uh, uh, Keyser wins. Keyser wins the primary. All right, Keyser wins the primary, and he goes up against Phil Hoff. Now there, there was no there, oh, and that was the Republican primary, right? Um, I'm, I'm missing something in my mind right here because I was also sent to Ray Niquette's house. Well, the one was, the 1960 was probably Ray Niquette. No, and, no, because Hoff was 62. Yeah, and I know Hoff was 62. He oh, I was, I was, I was. Anyway, right. Ray Niquette lost. Right. He lost that primary, right? So there's, I'm up, I'm two, two primaries right here, and I'm losing twice, right? So 1962 comes along, mm -hmm. and it's a general election. And uh, Rusty says to me, well, why don't we, you such a good job for <laughs> covering the losers. We'll send you to Phil Hoff's house. <laughs> In 62 November. In 62 November. And I said, yeah, fine. I, okay. That's yeah, okay. So I went over to his house election night, general election night, 1962. Uh -huh. And I arrived at his house. They were most gracious, uh, he and, and, and Joan, his wife Joan. And he said, I'm going to be very busy. And I said, I understand that. I'm just going to be watching you, and I'll be just reporting on what you're doing and what I see. And if I have a question, I'll make sure you know it in advance. See? Well, I... Very, anyway, very polite. I did that twice, right? And uh -huh. Then the third time I said, okay, it's enough about asking you in advance. <laughs> Next question. But anyway, uh, as the night progressed, right, it, the votes are very, very tight, very tight. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know where the name escapes me, a lawyer, very large. Uh, I'll think about it as we go along. Fred Fayette? No, no, it wasn't Fred Fayette. Uh, Laro. Bob Laro. Oh, Bob Laro. Bob Laro, right? Well, in, in Phil Hoff's house, you walk in the front door, and there is a, you know, it's the entryway. Stairs go up to the left, go this way to go into the living quarters. Right. And there is two phones. One is mine, and the other is the house phone. And about 11 o'clock at night, Laro parks himself right in front of that table. And Big I, guy. And I, yeah, and I know what he's waiting for. Right. He's waiting for the Winooski vote to come in. Right. Everybody is. This time, though, the house is jam-packed. Oh, my God. I never could get in to the other side right. because I had to be there. The phone rings. Laro picks up the phone, and he says, tell me. And all of a sudden, I reach around him and grab my phone, right? The whole thing. Right. Right? Because it's long since the whole You're thing. You're hearing it live. Right. And Phil Hoff walks in because he hears Laro say, tell me. And so Laro turns around and he says, you won. I grab the governor by the arm. Up the stairs we go. First room on the left is his bedroom. Priscilla LaPlante, his secretary, Correct. follows us upstairs, right? We go into the bedroom. He goes on that side of the bed. I'm on this side of the bed. Priscilla's there. And I say, lean against the door because people want to come Sure. <clears throat> and so, uh, and I could hear Rusty saying, we'll go to South Burlington. And here is, here's Norm James. And I said, thank you, Rusty. The, uh, the Rock River Republican state of Vermont has been cracked to its very foundation with the election of Philip Henderson Hoff as its next governor. And Phil Hoff is looking at me across the road, and all of a sudden he starts to run his hands through his hair. Like, what am I going to say? Right. You know, what am I going to do? 
And I said, Governor-elect Hoff, <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> Hand it over to him. And he said a few words and so forth. Yeah. Then, uh, but then you could... Went, great moment. Went, went, yeah, it was a great moment because then you could feel the whole house rock. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the house was really literally rock. And poor Priscilla was just leaning up against the door. There was about two or three people on the other side wanted to come in. That moment passed. Phil went out. And then, as the story, as you know, he went on to Winooski. Um, the parade. The parade, the big parade, the right? And, uh, and it was, uh, that, that was that moment. That was that, just that freeze that moment. And oh. you were there. I was there. Every but, second. I, but I will never forget that, uh, that look on his face, though. Mm. Looking at me, rubbing his hands through his hair, like, what do I do now? And he went on to have one of the most successful administrations. He was the first governor that I know of to go for three two-year terms. Correct. And uh, it was, it was kind of tight that third time around. But the very first thing he did, though, was gather around him very intelligent people. I remember being at that time called a Tavern Motor Inn. Mm -hmm. It's Capitol Plaza today. Mm -hmm. a great big table. Uh, he had he had two great big tables, right? Each filled uh, ten times, twenty people. And he said, "These are the smartest people that I know of in these various skill sets." And he said, that "I want to start with this. Tell me what you know." And he had people taking notes all over the place. And that was the genesis of his very first legislative thing. And remember, he had to get it done. This was November. He had to get a budget in by uh, January. By, by January. A Republican and, legislature. Uh, and a Republican legislature. The first Democratic governor. Correct. And not only the, the budget. The had not happened yet. That's true. That was one man. That was, that was one town, one vote. 246 towns and cities. That's the size of that House of Representatives. And 30 senators, but again, not based on population. Right. <coughs> so the town of Stratton had 38 voters and Burlington had 38,000. Correct. And they, they each had, had one, one vote. In, right. Right. Well, the, the reapportionment. So let me let me f finish uh, this off. He not only had he had to have a what you call the inaugural address. Right. And at that and that time, uh, when the governor was sworn in, and, uh, just a few years ago, they stopped doing the following. The Army National Guard brought up their 105 howitzers up on to the top part of the uh, of the walkway. And when the governor was taking the oath, he just fired off these can of 21 gun salute. Right. The windows are just rattling. Oh, people were fearful that they were really going to break. But anyway, that's aside. But it, it was, that, was, that was remarkable. And he went to the legislature. He got things done. Bill Billings was the secretary, was the speaker, uh, speaker of the House. From Woodstock. Yeah. One of the Young Turks. Exactly. Well, remember when Phil Hoff was a part of the House, representative from Burlington, he and Bill Billings. Dick Mallory. And Dick Mallory, John right. John Downs. You're right, John Downs. Gibson. Yeah. Uh, Gibson. They were called the Young Turks. Mm -hmm. and, oh, and a few years ago, the same political uh, philosophy was called Blue Dogs. Mm -hmm. But these guys were the Young Turks. and they Mainly were, young Republicans. Mainly, mainly, yes, yes. In their 30s. Right, but they were... Uh, they were Thoughtful. Forward-thinking. Thoughtful is a very Aiken good word. Aiken Gibson Republicans. Right, yes. Well... Jefford Stafford. <laughs> when Tom Salmon became governor... Well, uh, we'll get to that. We want to step to that, right? But anyway, Phil Hoff had a very successful administration. His run for... Um, his run for the, for, the, uh, for the Senate against Winston Prouty. On the Prouty side, the decision was made by Chuck Colson. Remember that name? Yes, I do. Chuck Colson, one of the guys was indicted because of Watergate. Right. Well, he was the instructor for Prouty's campaign from directly from the Nixon White House. You will not campaign. We will have it. You remember this? Senator Prouty must serve us again. Yes. That's all they play. Right. Great lingo. You never, you never saw him. Uh, uh, you never heard him on the radio. You never saw him on television. That's all they had, right? And they and they cooked up uh, the the. Uh, the Colson and his gang cooked up some dirty tricks that happened against Hoff, mm -hmm. um, and they and Phil did have a personal issue with uh, alcohol, fought it, didn't let it. You know, they fought it, they brought it out, so forth, and then they just kept hammering on him. Mm -hmm. Nixon came to Vermont. Nixon did come to Vermont for a proud. Still a safe Republican state at the time. At the time, right. Tell us about reapportionment. We have about eight minutes left on this segment. 
and, eight um, minutes left. We may have to do three segments. It's going to be a part one, part two, and maybe a part three. But reapportionment was 64. You went to Channel 3 at the time. In 1959, I went to, ch uh, to Channel, uh, no, 59, DEV. 1964 was after the election in November of 1964 that I went to Channel 3. I was hired from WDEV. Uh, Mickey Gallagher uh, had, had talked with Red Martin, the owner of uh, Channel 3 at the time, about setting up a Montpelier Bureau. And when Mickey gave me a call and wanted to have lunch, he talked with me about that concept, and I liked it very much. I thought that it was time for Channel 3 to expand uh, because that bureau could also be used for other news directly out of Montpelier. Exactly. Or even Barry. Right. You know, you could have a live satellite situation. But I got the satellite yet, but it was all film, right? I, I call it non-compatible black and white film because that's exactly what it was. <laughs> it was before Technicolor. But, and it was Bob Mesterton uh, was, was one of the cameramen. Uh -huh. And you sit down for an interview like this, and if I'm the camera, he would take a tape measure to go from the lens to your nose and set the aperture. <laughs> oh, just High tech. Uh, yeah. Well, Walter Cronkite <laughs> called it the one-ton pencil. <laughs> one-ton pencil. <laughs> and that's what it was. Yeah. But it was fun also. And you're the first bureau chief for Channel 3 WCX. That's true. In Montpelier. That's true. 64, 65 time period. Correct. Right. And so, and that, and that happened in uh, November. We got the bureau set up in December of 64. Uh, and it was at that time I was getting myself uh, adjusted to who's in the legislature because they were going to come back in January and I wanted to make sure that I was up to speed in, in 1965 was going to be the reapportionment year. Right. There were about three pieces of legislation uh, on the House side uh, that was uh, were introduced. One calling for a 90-member House, the other for 210, and the other for 150. And understand at the same time, the Vermont legislature was under federal court order to reapportion. Mm -hmm. I mean, they and they had to reapportion by June 30th. Well, they did. But it was it was very emotional. I would say that uh, more than ever, not only were they changing almost political philosophies at that time, because I think that's when the bend came from being more conservative Republican to being more moderate Republican and the introduction of the Democrat philosophy, uh, mm -hmm. philosophy in mm -hmm. terms of uh, public policy. Mm -hmm. It was that that was the whole the whole thing. Um, Reapportionment was a watershed moment for Vermont history. Oh, there's no question about that, mm -hmm. and uh, I hope, I hope that that one piece is taught in Vermont history in all of the schools. Whether or not the school carries Vermont history, it's a part of the economy. It's a part of every other everyday life. Mm -hmm. From that moment mm -hmm. on, things change. So it's 240 members. It was 246 members. And they went to 150. They went to 150. So you Emory lost about Hubbard. 100. That's lost about 90. Yeah, right. Emory Hebbard of Glover. Was, uh, was the chair of the reapportionment committee, uh -huh. 25 members. And it was his committee that had to go through the 90, 150, 210 versions and what that was going to mean. It wasn't just picking a number because you also had a mathematic issue. Uh, you had to discern, discern which contiguous districts would give you a certain amount of voters. Right. Because one man, one vote, right? So. The person from Burlington, that's why Burlington ended up with so many uh, representatives, right? And that's why Stratton is now in with a group of towns that equal that number of voters. Right. So that was the whole basis of reapportionment. In the Senate, they stayed at 30 uh, senators, but they realigned some of the, the Senate to, uh, counties. They used to be based on counties. Mm -hmm. Now they're senatorial districts. And so that you will see like Ch Chittenden Grand Isle. Uh, Essex, Orleans, uh, and, Ca and Caledonia, etc. Right. Yeah. Now you see those senators to equal, I think it's 3,000, used to be 3,000 uh, voters. Um, so that was, uh, I remember uh, Frank Hutchins from Stannard. Stannard. Way up in the Northeast Kingdom, 90 people, I believe, something like that. And he, as you walk into the house, he's on the right hand side. Tom Schmidt, represented from Burlington, is on the left and upper back. And I'm up, uh, b up next to the roster because I had the camera going. That's where we were, capture it all. Frank Hutchins stood up and uh, reached up, clicked the camera on, and he got to talking about re don't forget us small towns. 
reached into his back pocket, pulled out his white handkerchief. Tears were rolling down his eyes. Mm. And he says, just don't forget us small people. That's a poignant moment. I mean, Very poignant. Uh, that, that is a moment that tells everything about reapportionment, about the establishment of public policy. Because it, we're, if you really believe that public policy starts at the grassroots, bottom up, then you have to remember those folks. Next question. Well, it's really Vermont from the 1800s moving into the 1900s. Yeah, but I wasn't there in the 1800s. But, but was, <laughs> the, the, the legislature was, a repl was <laughs> an ornament from the 1800s that had one person. It reminds me of a story yeah. uh, at, at one of the local uh, watering holes uh, many years ago. Uh -huh. uh, I'm enjoying an adult. The Brown Derby or the Tavern? Uh, the, no, no, the Thrush. The Thrush. Oh, if you can speak. That came, that came later. If you can speak. Speak of the Thrush. Right. And so, no, it was just about age and so forth. It's got nothing to do with anything except they're playing trivia. And somebody said, so what was the name of the play in the Ford Theater when Lincoln got shot? And I said, our American cousin. Somebody looked at me and said, how do you know? I was there. <laughs> <laughs> also a vignette for 65. It was the year that um, there, be, there used to be more cows than people, but from 65 on, Big there's shift. more people than cows. Big shift. And the town of Victory finally got electricity. 1968. 68 was when Victory got electricity. And those are my roots there. In Victory. In Victory. My, my grandfather was born there. My great-grandfather was born there. In 1968. And then they used to have the holiday in the hills to celebrate that. And it was, it was um, George Aiken that was responsible. The United States Senator was responsible for uh, rural electrification. It's nomenclature that, that represents what they did. And they strung that electric line. I think from North Concord right up Victory Road. And by golly, the lights came on. The last town in Vermont to receive. Yeah, but can you imagine what well, that was? That was 1960, what month? 68. I don't know the month. <clears throat> but, but can you imagine what it was like before then? The kerosene lanterns all over the place are candles. Right. You know, talk about being in the forest with a lighted match. Mm. We'll take a short break, and we'll be back in just a moment with Norman James. About 1.30 uh, in the afternoon, and all of a sudden, uh, there's music on, so I wasn't on the air per se, but I was reading a commercial, getting it ready, and all of a sudden the red lights go zoom, zoom, and I could hear the machine banging, bang, bang, the bells going off, bells going off. Oh, wow, so I got up and walked up, and UPR was saying, all off, everyone off. No, excuse me, I said, uh, Kennedy shot, the flash, Kennedy shot, bang, and then the paper came up, all off, all off. Dallas has the wire. And, and then you know, President John F. Kennedy shot, bang. <gasps> Man, that's coming off. Well, Rusty Parker's office, the control room at what, one end of the building, on 9 Stowe Street, second floor. Back of the building was control room. The front of the building, up over Edtown store at that time, right. was Rusty Parker's office, right? So you come out of the uh, come off of the out of the newsroom we call where the television machine is and I yelled hey Rusty and he looked up and I said let's go and so he came in and he was running through the, the record library and I said Kennedy's been shot and he said okay so he took the bulletin and he went on the air with it uh, and in the meantime I've got I got some uh, we call it long playing music but it's a, it's not a drab symphony it's just different kind of music Rusty put it right on uh, and said, we interrupt this broadcast to bring you this following. Blah, blah. And so I was feeding him, and then I was on the phone calling the governor, calling lieutenant governor, calling all state officials, calling everybody I could find for a reaction to all of this. It was fresh news. And then at the, at the typewriter at that time, a royal manual, you know, banging this stuff out, ripping it off, and taking it into uh, to the control room. Ken came bouncing up the stairs. Ken Squire. Ken Squire, yeah, came bouncing up the stairs. Wow, what's happened? And, uh, and the office staff, uh, Barbara Butterfield, Connie Therrien, and I have forgotten for some reason the other third lady that was there. Oh, and, the, and uh, 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 not a Connie Therrien, but Connie Graves and a, a fourth lady. I forgot her name. All of a sudden, they're speechless. And they're just so emotional. Mm -hmm. And so that was that moment. Um, it, was, it, it was really tough. 
It was tough. And I, I saw later uh, the Walter Cronkite video when he took off his glasses, right? Mm. Boy, I know exactly how he felt at that time. And I think everybody did, regardless of political stripe. Mm -hmm. They did that, right? So that happened on that Friday uh, uh, afternoon. Sunday morning, I'm on the air, the following Sunday, mm -hmm. right? By that time, there was a cortege you know, the, for the funeral procession going to <coughs> on its way to, um, uh, to the cemetery to Arlington. And I'm listening to Mutual Network on the, uh, on the, on the wire. <coughs> that was our, you know, just listening to them describe what's happening. Um, and then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm playing in the middle of a church program, right? A live church program. All of a sudden, Mutual comes on and says, Oswald has been shot. We'll take you now to the, to the uh, youth, a, uh, Dallas. A Dallas County Jail. And they had a reporter there. Mm -hmm. And reporters talking, you know, and I'm sitting there with a church thing going on here, national news happening. Okay, here we go. So I open the mic, we interrupt this program for this news um, it, from Dallas, Texas, Lee Harvey Oswald, who was arrested uh, as the alleged assassin of uh, John, uh, President John F. Kennedy, has been shot in the jail. And I'm listening and saying the same thing. I was doing that before they do it today. <laughs> it was... It was there, and finally, okay, that was news. Mutual came on, we put them on, and, and that was that. Mm. It was a hell of a weekend. Amazing weekend. I went home. Exhausted. I, I, I did, but Saturday night, it's always been hockey night in Canada. Right. And where we lived, we could pick up Channel 6, CBM Montreal, and they had a hockey game going. And I said, I, so I put, put the hockey game on. I had it on for two minutes, and I said, I can't watch this. I've got to get back. That is how strong that was. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that was that. November of 1963. Correct. And of course, in 64, you're, you, you go to Channel 3. CIA. I go to Channel 3. 65 is a reapportionment session. They're about 10 years old. They started in 54, it, Channel 3. Yeah, yeah, right. And, um, and he had a one-ton pencil. <laughs> Do they have like yeah. a 15-minute news show at, at 6? Um, they did have a 15-minute news show. Was Mickey Gallagher the speaker yep. then? Yep, yep, yep. Rich, Richard Gallagher, Mickey Gallagher. And, he, and uh, I can... Tony Adams was doing sports. Sports and Tony... Uh, weather. It, right. And uh, Ken Green was and doing Charlie, whatever. It, Charlie, uh, uh, he was in charge of uh, development. I see. Uh, PR development stuff. And mm. Charlie... Uh, Lewis. Lewis was in charge of public affairs. He right. did the You Can Quote Me program. Mm -hmm. and, and that was fun. To, to be on, you get a guy on and uh, ask him questions. Mickey was Mickey was the the, um, the consummate news person. Mm -hmm. He really, really tried very hard. He admitted that he was you know a rather conservative guy, mm -hmm. and but he really tried very hard to be open um, to that. And he used to tell me, "Well, what are you?" I said, "I'm a moderate." Well, you can't be because the opposite of a moderate is immoderate. <laughs> <laughs> so we talk <laughs> political philosophy every Friday night when right. I go over to do the program. Right. So, uh, yeah. yeah. I was going to mention, oh, in 1966, that was the uh, reapportioned 150-member uh, House. The new election of 66 produced the new, correct. the new House. Correct, correct. And w what happened there uh, was... Plus third term begins as well. Yeah, his third term begins. But then all of a sudden, w reform begins. Welfare reform begins. The poor farms are taken away. The overseer of the poor is gone. Uh, there is, there, every town has got a health up. In other words, socially, socially, the bar was being slowly raised here in the state of Vermont. Uh, and for all the right, right, right purposes. But then after that uh, came 19, I was there, I went back to DEV mm -hmm. after the- uh, 68. November of 68, and I stayed there. And back to radio? Back to radio. Uh, Rusty at, Parker gave you a raise? As your news director, he did. As your <laughs> news director, he did. Uh, How could they live without you, and you know? cover and, and, co and covering the state house again. Uh, still, I should say. Right. Uh, only this time I didn't have the big one-ton pencil. Had a little tape recorder, a little uh -huh. microphone. Um, more mobile. More mobile, right. And my office was literally the size of a telephone booth. Mm -hmm. yeah, all I needed, that's all I needed. Were you guys up in the crow's nest? Yes. 
that's where I started there at DEV, up in the Crow's Nest, up, in, up under the dome, which you can't get to today. Mm. And I guess there's going to be some reconstruction up mm. there. Um, yeah, UPI, AP, the Press Bureau, which was Rutland Herald and Times Argus, the Free Press, uh -huh. and DEV were all up there. So who was impressed with it? Steve Terry? Was he there? Steve Terry was in charge of the Press Bureau. John Pers Mahoney worked for him. Uh -huh. uh, Bill Moran was the head of AP, and Bill Moran went on to uh, Associated Pre uh, CBS right. as a producer in New York. Right. Was Vic Markey still at Vic Markey the was, Free Press? He, he, was, yeah, he was with the Free Press, but Mavis Doyle was a Free Press at that right. time. Right, because Vic Markey went to Channel 22. Well, wait a minute. Okay. Vic was with the Free Press in Burlington. Right. Then he went to Channel 22. Right. Right. With Brian Harwood, by Correct. the way. Correct. Uh, and then he went on to public radio. After Bob, his, he went, he went from there to Bob Stafford's office in Washington, and then from there to public radio in Washington. Right. But Mavis Doyle then worked for the Free Press. Right. After Vic Markey, before she worked for the Rutland Herald. Correct. So what was she like? Oh, Mavis uh, was, was, a, was a great reporter. Uh, sometimes very vitriolic, but boy, she really. Yeah, if they, you've heard this before, and uh, I, I don't know who came up with it, but they were right. Mavis had a mantra, all right, is, is you um, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. Mm. Uh, and she wanted just to make sure that the people on the short end of the stick got a fair shake. That was her mantra. Mm -hmm. uh, and she did that. Uh, another Mavis Doyle story. At one time, there was a I won't mention him, a, a, a former lobbyist from Massachusetts government, came to Vermont to live and work in the, our state house and as a lobbyist. And he was, and Mae was, well, was probably about 5'10", five, five, mm -hmm. 6 foot tall. Mm -hmm. She was a tall lady. And uh, she smoked Chesterfields. <laughs> she did. <laughs> she did. And, but this guy was standing <coughs> on the first step going upstairs to the, in the go to the governor's office in the state house, uh -huh. and she was standing on the floor, right. and she was face to face with him. She had the cigarette hanging out of her mouth, and she was the last thing, and she's poking him on the chest. <laughs> the last thing we need here is a dirty, rotten Massachusetts politician. <laughs> and this poor guy is out. Huh? <laughs> Hello, Mavis Doyle. <laughs> the Mavis treatment. <laughs> right. And Steve Terry was for the before he went to work for George Aiken. That's correct. He was doing the Rutland Herald. Yeah. My press bureau. Yeah. He was in charge. John Mahoney wrote for him. Who was uh, UPI? Tony, Tony Merrill also wrote for him. Right. Um, at that time. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And know. UPI, was this before Ron Clark? Oh, yeah. Ron, Ron Cohen. Okay. Ron Cohen uh, was the press uh, uh, bureau. He, he was the UPI press bureau right. back then. And he went on um, UPI all the way to the top. He was there when it was sold. He wrote a book about it wow. with a co-author, right, Down to the Wire. The book is Down to the Wire. Google it, down to the wire. Ron Cohen. Ron Cohen. But he wrote a second book uh -huh. about his memoirs. And he's got two or three memoirs about what happened in Vermont. Wow. And that is called, Of Course You Can Have Ice Cream for Breakfast. <laughs> and that is, that's it. Google this. Google, Google this. this. Of Course You Can Have Ice Cream for Christmas. Uh, for, for, breakfast. for breakfast. Try that. You Ron Cohen, C-O-H-E-N. -E Ron Cohen, right. U-P-I. In Montpelier, 64-65, and then he moved up the ladder. Wow. Oh, yeah, a great reporter. Is he still alive? Oh, yes, yes. We correspond on Facebook quite Where frequently. Where does he live? In Washington. He's retired. Future episode of our program. Well, that's true, too. I can tell you some Ron <laughs> Cohen stories. <laughs> Go ahead. Gee, what? No. I just. So you're up there in the crow's nest. Yeah. And... Um, and you're back with DEV in 68. Correct. And, um, and of course, Bobby Kennedy's, well, it was November of 68, you come back with DEV. Yeah, yeah. So the, the Kennedy assassination of, of Bobby Kennedy was in June. Martin Luther King was in April. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but still, 68 is the last year of the Phil Hoff period. Correct. And, and that and was a tumultuous campaign for yeah. Phil Hoff um, because of that problem, that it was exploited uh, by uh, Chuck Colson. Uh, that was 70. He ran for the Senate in 1970. 70, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's 68. But, but right. Dean Davis was elected Dean in 68. Dean Davis, right, right. Exactly. And actually 50 came in. Um, yeah. Because the Republicans reclaimed the governorship in 68. Act 250 came in for all of the right reasons. Sponsored by the Republicans. Yes, right. And Opposed then. Sponsored by the Democrats, actually. And then, well, and then, and then later, 
uh, it was called, what did Gallagher call it? Statewide zoning. Uh, right. And I forget the name of the bill, but it was like, it was Act 250, Act uh, 258, which dealt with the water. Right. Uh, so forth, all of those. And, uh, and, and Mickey was just against it. Right. He said it's statewide zoning. I don't know that it was, was but the it big sure issue did the, set up some parameters to protect our environment. I'm sorry. Was that the big issue of that time period? Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and do you remember right, right. the Mount Snow episode that created it? Or well, all I know down there is that was, uh, effluent was rolling down the hill. Right. Dean Davis saw it and said, we've got to bring this to a screeching halt. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he proposed the legislation, and, and it did. The, uh, just, uh, you know, Arthur about Gibbs, part of the... Art Gibbs was the champion of all of that. Right. Yeah, he, he wrote the legislation. Republican from Windsor County? For, no, uh, from, um, it was Middlebury. Addison. Addison County. But he was the environmentalist in the State House. Yep. Yeah, there's and a big Teddy portrait. Roosevelt there's Republican. a big portrait of Art up there in the State House. Yeah. Wall. But remember, the labor folks were against Act 250 because it, it affected jobs and construction. That's what interests. they thought. That's what they thought. And in the beginning. So these early yeah. Republicans were the champions. The Teddy Roosevelt Republicans, conservationists, became the environmentalists. Well, they were always environmentalists. Right. But they just had different nomenclatures. And the problem is, is that we can't have effluent rolling down. Right. You know, being totally exposed to the public. Come on. So whatever you, if, nomenclature, whatever handle you want right. to give it, it's crap. Right. And it has to be taken care of. Right. And everybody understood that. And the question was, well, how are we going to do this without affecting what we've already known? What we've always known. It's always, every time there's new public policy, it always says, well, how is it going to be? It used to be this way. Oh, I remember when. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll do it for now. Well, for now, never come. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's really, a, uh, I think, an issue. You remember the Roland Stewart quote about it all? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The Roland Stewart, he was yeah, from. Say it, say it to me. But it, what it, town it, was he from? Yeah, Rutland. Yeah. Seward, what, Seward Dairy. Right. 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 The dairy people. Right. Something and like, he was a Republican National Committee man. Yeah. What are you saving the environment and for? The animals? You know, the animals, or, right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. All right. And he was picked up on that. Yeah, he was. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, it's one of those kinds of things. You know, that, mm -hmm. It's a slip of the tongue that you say unconsciously, but you really feel it and somebody hears it. Interesting in Vermont history, though, that the early pioneers of the environmental movement were Republican moderates. Because that's what we're and in also town. Also, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's what we're in town. All right. The Dems never got here. Right. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of th th their influence on public policy until after reapportionment, and it was only beginning at that time to come around. Mm -hmm. Sure, Republicans can take it, but to me, it's it goes way beyond party label. Mm -hmm. It's people who are concerned about the quality of life. Mm -hmm. We hear that quite frequently about living in Vermont, the quality of life. Well, anybody, a Democrat, progressive, independent, want to take that on as saying that I invented it, go right ahead, but it's here. Right, right. Yeah. Now, from 68 to 72, um, you're DEV. Right. Um, there's a four-year period here. Right. Um, Tom Simon becomes elected governor in 72, but from right. 68 to 72, what were some of the news stories? What were what, some things that were happening well, the big thing was the campaign. Uh, Obviously, Dean Davis was between Phil Hoff and Tom Salmon. Yeah, I know. And that was the Act 250 years uh, and so forth. Um, and uh, it, it, it was quite, quite progressive. I, it, Tom Hayes, Lieutenant Governor, Republican, former Winston Prouty legislative assistant right. in Washington. Comes thoughtful back, fellow. Very, very thoughtful. Comes back to Vermont. Relocates his family, Jenny and his kids in Burlington, um, and uh, he gets involved in politics. He is a politician, so he runs and he's elected uh, lieutenant governor. Dean, you know, separate ballot, you know, uh, and Dean Davis like the governor. So here's Dean Davis, a uh, well-respected businessman. National life. National life, a very a rather conservative individual, except when he got to Act 250. And here's Tom Hayes, an up-and-coming Republican who is a bit more progressive. Kent State happens. Mm -hmm. And the National Guard shoots some students at Kent, Kent State campus. And the news just hits all over. Dean Davis is out in Colorado. Tom Hayes immediately asks for the flags to be flown at half-staff. Dean Davis jumps on a plane, comes back to Vermont, and raises the flags back up. 
all of that happened well over two or three days mm -hmm. but that was it was news mm -hmm. at that time uh, uh, I can remember uh, that Tom Hayes ran for governor in a primary against Dean Davis uh, yeah against about Dean the Davis. sales tax right about the sa no it wasn't about the sale you know, I'll tell you what the sales tax uh, was sales tax there was never any issue of the sales tax mm -hmm. Tom Hayes made up some bumper stickers that no, say uh, it was something like we don't need or say no to, uh, to sales tax. It was never on the ballot. It was never an issue. But people thought it was. Mm -hmm. It's one of those campaign techniques that you get bought into it. Mm -hmm. And said, yeah, there was an issue. Well, there really wasn't at that time. Excuse me. Yeah. So that's what, and, and Tom lost. But um, Tom Salmon, after he became governor, Hired in 70, Tom, seventy-two. And, right, he hired Tom as, as, as the governor's lawyer, a gubernatorial, uh, legal legal person. Mm -hmm. Nori Hoyt was also that, but Nori Hoyt the specialized is was a tax person, and Nori Hoyt was the guy that came up with uh, the Tom Salmon uh, tax plan. The property tax. The property tax, rebate. and that was be more than that. That was um, that was to fight a, a development. Uh, uh, r making money on, on development, mm -hmm. best way I can explain it. Let me r explain the issue. You buy a piece of property and you turn it over in a year, you're taxed at 60%. And it goes down each year if you hold it out for five years, you hold it up for five years, you don't pay any tax on turning it over. You mm -hmm. sign. So it was to prevent people just coming in and buying and selling property and mm -hmm. prices going way up mm -hmm. and cutting the Vermonter out. Well, Nori came up with the formula, and he came up with the legislation. Tom uh, Salmon campaigned on that issue. In 72 against Fred Hackett. Right. And he also campaigned on one other issue. Fred Hackett went down to Massachusetts, to Boston, during the campaign, was speaking to a group of engineers. And he said, well, I don't think we need that bottle bill in Vermont. He wanted to repeal the bottle bill, right? Mm -hmm. So he came back up. We caught wind of it, or Joe Jamelli uh, caught wind of that at that mm -hmm. time, a uh, very good friend of mine. And uh, he uh, uh, turned that right around. And been, uh, especially in the agriculture community, because we want bottles and cans being thrown into pastures or environmental community alongside the highways, sure. transportation, all of that stuff. You know, we roll that all together. Well. Uh, make a long story short, Tom Salmon won that uh, general election and went on to four years. Ran against Bob Stafford uh, for the U.S. Senate in '76. '76 lost very by lost by five percent of the vote. It was very close. It was very close. It was very close. There mm -hmm. was a he. We, I don't know. So it was uh, the issue had to deal with the Ticonderoga, Ticonderoga paper mill mm -hmm. about them dumping sludge into Lake Champlain and. Uh, uh, the argument uh, at that time was Stafford was turning a blind eye to it, and that and that issue tried to be developed into a campaign uh, mm -hmm. issue, but yeah, it was close. The '72 race with Salmon was very much a watershed. I remember being a delegate to the national convention, and it was in July. And we still did not have a, a candidate for governor. That's and, right. And so we were actually we we're having a couple of beers with the Wisconsin delegation, so we went to Tom Simmons. Will you please run? And he, he agreed to do that, and, and John Letty was another, became his driver. Right. And, but he started pretty late, late August, September, but he did a listening tour, but he was smart enough to make the 72 election a referendum on property tax reform. Uh, they are, right, it, it, he did. But let me back up for just a second to add to your story, is that Chuck Delaney, a state senator from Chittenden County, mm -hmm. had put his name in right. as, uh, as a what, space holder. Right. So when Tom came back from that national convention, talked to Chuck, Chuck pulled out, Tom put in, but there was no opposition. Correct. So he had the time to do that listening tour. And he did make it about property tax uh, a relief and uh, the, the whole issue of property tax. And he won by 40,000 votes. Yeah, he did. And Nixon won Vermont against McGovern by a, a landslide. It's still a pretty Republican state in 72. Yeah. And for Sam to win by 40,000, a very impressive victory. It was very impressive. Very impressive. It, it, it's, and um, we had, he had a cabinet, a big cabinet. Then you have what's called a kitchen cabinet, but a big cabinet. I can remember it. You, we'd get in the conference room, around the table, mm -hmm. and there was no rubber stamping. 
people were encouraged to speak their mind. Mm -hmm. And I can remember one time when we were talking about raising the gasoline tax. And the comment was made, if you want to make, pretend you're crazy, go right ahead. That's a hell of a comment to make because people couldn't afford five, five cent increase in the right. price tag. Right. And uh, then there was the energy crisis. Right. We developed an energy office and we tagged Forrest Orr from the uh, Environmental Conservation Agency mm -hmm. to be our energy czar. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> all he could do was answer the phone because, you know, and, because people were calling, you know, the price of gasoline. Going into a gasoline in station. In the odd even days? In the odd even day. We even thought about <clears> that. And no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to go along with our course. We even talked about changing uh, uh, daylight saving time, mm -hmm. uh, changing the time, and so forth. No, forget that. We're just going to go along as we are. We used to get calls into the office about tankers being sighted off the coast of Massachusetts refusing to dock. Yeah, right. <laughs> so... So yeah. Joe Gemelli was running Tom Salmon's, he left the Vermont Press Bureau. Correct. To run the campaign. Correct. With Don Webster. Yep. And then you're still a newsman at DEV. Right. But Salmon wins. Yeah. And they make you the press secretary communications director. Well, it wasn't communications director Tell so much. Tell me what happened. Uh, well, what you happened was, the inner circle Joe, uh, uh, Tom gave me a call. He said, I'd like to have you come to work for me. All right. I said, absolutely, sure. And the very first thing was, and, and then appointments came up. Don Webster was made the Commissioner of Economic Development. Mm -hmm. Joe was, a, I was appointed Secretary of Civil and Military Affairs. Right. I was assistant to the governor, mm -hmm. all right? Joe and I took the piece of paper, and out the, the, uh, the chart, state government chart, organization chart. Mm -hmm. We divided it in half, all right? He, he had health and welfare where Tom Davis was, mm -hmm. uh, and I had... Told me I had the cows over here for agriculture, and and Martin Johnson and natural conservation. So we had people, and I had the environment, basically. And all we did was just keep tabs on what can we do. You know, is, is it just keeping tabs and and making sure that the public policy created by the legislature is followed uh, by the administration. And you're there all four years. Yeah. To the end. You're right. Did you enjoy that job? I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed it very much. It was a it was a great uh, window onto what creates public policy, everything that goes into it. And sometimes it is, as has been said before, watching sausage being made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did uh, an awful lot of uh, mechanical stuff, heart stuff, emotional stuff. It's all of that. Peanut Kennedy is the House Speaker. Peanut Kennedy is the House Speaker, and uh, he was a he, he had a sense of humor. And John Burgess was. Lieutenant Governor in the, in the Senate. Uh, yeah, he was our Lieutenant Governor in, in the Senate. Replaced by Brian Bur Burns. Uh, Brian Burns. Later. Later. <laughs> Brian Burns was a, a big, rough guy. Young guy from Chittenden County. Yeah, definitely a Burlington politician. Right. Well, he had quite a, quite a primary against Stella Hackel for, a, right. for the Democratic primary. And John O'Brien was in that primary as it, well. It's correct, yeah. Which produced Richard Snelling in the end. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. But let's back, let's back up to, uh, uh, to uh, Peanut Kennedy. Peanut Kennedy was the guy that rammed, so I say rammed, they don't like the word ram, but pushed through th that act, uh, through, through the 4% sales tax. Right. Through the House. And that was Dean Davis's a big, big issue you know, at that time. 4%, food exempted, clothing exempted, and it was for, to, for education. All was for education, right? So 4% went in. That was a big battle. Peanut's from Chelsea. Chelsea. You was, he, was he speaker through all of Dean Davis? Yes, I believe so. So he was a power broker. He was, but not the same power broker. And here's another story. It's about Ralph Wright, <laughs> former former representative from Bennington. From Bennington right. Who was Massachusetts a born. Democrat, Massachusetts from born. Right. Uh, Quincy Mass Roots, uh -huh. uh, who was a real power broker. Very Massachusetts kind of guy. Yeah. Nice guy, though. Yeah, sweet yeah. fellow. Oh, they all were. They all they are. are. They still alive. We will be back um, for another episode with Norman James, Memories and Reflections on Vermont History. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.